take a moment and consider God's presence with us here this evening. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you've gathered us here today, together tonight. We ask that um, you open our hearts and minds to, uh, to tonight's saint. We ask that you send St. Philomena here to be with us and to uh, help us learn something about her life that we can take and apply to our everyday lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, so as you can tell, um, I'm not going to give the talk again this week. Um, I'm letting my wife Shannon do it because she's actually the person who introduced me to St. Philomena um, a long time ago. She said, uh, you ought to, when this is probably at least seven, eight, nine years ago, she said, you ought to consider presenting St. Philomena. And I'm like, who? Mm -hmm. And uh, the more I learned about St. Philomena, I realized that she's, I realized that she is, is a very powerful intercessor. And since then, I've actually had a couple miracles that hurt with her intercession helping out. Um, but, you know, I would encourage all of you to get to know her because she, um, she's a real powerful saint. So without t taking too much of Shannon's information away from you, um, I'm going to let her present. I'm just going to shift the camera over and then we'll let her take it away. Before I begin, I just want to make sure that everybody knows about the early Christians and the word Catholic. So if you go back about 600 years or so, the only Christians you would find are Catholics because Catholic truly means universal. So 600 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, all the way back to the time of Jesus after his death in the early Christians. When we talk about them, we're talking about Catholics because, again, we were all one until a time came when people started revolting against the church and trying to change it. So that's something to keep in mind. The next thing we're going to do in just about a moment is also do a prayer. And I'm going to invite each of you to close your eyes and to ask God what is the one thing that he wants you to take away from this talk. There are a lot of things that are come, going to come up. Something you know about me is I'm an introvert. This is really hard for me to do. I'm not a great orator like Steve, so I have my notes. And sometimes when the saints speak with me, if I'm lucky through me, it takes on a mind of its own and other things will come out. So just bear with me and know that God is in control and he has messages for you that maybe I didn't consider when I was putting together my notes. And so let us begin in prayer. Dear Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Abba, we thank you for the blessings you bestow upon us, both spiritual and material. We ask you to open our hearts Please send the Holy Spirit with the gifts of wisdom and understanding that we may better come to know St. Philomena and that we may have the grace to further open our hearts and our homes to this most powerful intercessor that comes from your heart. Please show each and every one of us the one thing you want us to take away from this talk this evening. And we pray together, Hail Mary, Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, patron of the church, pray for us. In Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so Philomena is considered the miracle worker of the 19th century. She was a saint that current saints and popes in their earthly lives pray to. Saints such as John Vianney, Blessed Anna Marie Taiji, Blessed Pauline Jericho, and Saint Damien, the leper priest. So who is Saint Philomena? A saint who was canonized based purely on her intercessions. Our story starts around the second to fifth century before Christ. With rare exception, around the time of Jesus, in Rome, you couldn't bury the dead. And so there had to be a place created where you could. These are the catacombs. 
The catacombs are underneath Rome, and if you stretch them out, they would literally go about several hundred miles. They were huge. And they're a maze-like labyrinth underneath the Eternal City. About 30, 40, 50 feet below, an entrance leads to a chamber, which leads to another one, layered one under the other. The entrances were hidden because this was also a place where Christians hid because of the persecution. And the persecution lasted a few hundred years. If a person of threat found the entrance, then a Christian could go deeper within because if you didn't have a layout of the map, you would get lost. And so it was both a place of protection where you could hide as well as a place for them to bury their dead. Though there are roughly over 60 catacombs around the area of Italy, please know that they're all over the world. France, Greece, Africa, and Asia Minor, they were used by Christians. Now fast forward, it is the year 1802. Working in the underground cemetery of St. Priscilla, excavators are clearing away sand when a pickaxe hits stone and they hear a sharp ding. The workers begin searching for what it is and they find a shelf tomb. They begin searching more and they realize it's been untouched. Now all the relics from this area had been removed in the 16th century and transferred. And here we have a tomb that has been untouched for who knows how long. They notify the guardian of cemeteries and cease work. And the Monsignor decides the next day he's gonna have a public opening so everyone can find out who this is. Now the burial stone was distinguished by three terracotta tiles with the following symbols, a palm, which is a symbol of martyrdom, an anchor and arrows. And in red, the following Latin inscription, Lumina Pax de Cum Fi. Now, it was determined that the tiles were out of order because of two things. One, Fi Lumina actually go together as opposed to the Fi being separate. Also because similar inscriptions were there, such as Pax Te Cum, and so in order, it would read, Pax Tecum Philumina, peace be with you, Philomena, daughter of light. So it's the next day and many are gathered, scientists, archeologists, the church hierarchy, lay people, curious to find out who this is and what's going on. They determine that the remains are of a 12 to 13 year old girl. Her bones and her body are unbroken, but she has a fractured skull and she's been lanced. Now keep in mind that some traditions in the ancient time would be a little odd to us today, but back then they were very reverent. So for example, in her tomb, they find a vial of blood. And in ancient times, a small amount of blood from a martyr would be placed in the vial and placed in the tomb, a sign of their martyrdom. So here we have a symbol of the palm and a vial of her blood, both indicating this is a martyr of the church. In the young girl's tomb to the side was also a broken vase with some brownish red, dark red substance, which was later determined scientifically to be blood. Now here's where we see our first miracle. As they're scraping the blood and dislodging the vase, and they're putting those particles into a clear vase, they start to see glorious colors, red like rubies, green like emeralds, even silver and gold, for all to witness who were there. And they wouldn't be the only ones to witness it. When the Cardinal put seals on the new vial, he too would witness these colors. And this, this reliquary, this vase, is at her tomb in Italy today. So if you or I went there, we might have the chance to see it. Keep in mind though, even though many people, both religious and lay people like you and I, have seen the colors, not everyone sees colors. Some people don't see anything. A few people have seen black particles, which they say is a sign to perhaps pray or amend one's life. 
and only one time was it ever recorded that the blood completely disappeared. And that was when a non-believer entered the church in complete disrespect. And it said that later it's recorded that that person died. Not because of what happened, but perhaps that was a warning to amend his life and he did not. So St. Philomena and her relics are put in a new black ebony coffin and they're immediately transferred to the Vatican custodian of relics. He begins searching, who is this Philomena? No one in the church could determine who this little girl was. There was no recording of the name Philomena in any of Rome documentation. Now, St. Priscilla was the wife of a pupil of the Apostle Paul. So the fact that Philomena was buried in her area of the cemetery is significant. She could only be buried there if she had a special lineage, yet they couldn't figure out who she was. So Philomena is transferred to the treasure house of relics and she remains there in silence for three years. About this time, a humble priest, Francesco de Lucia from Mugnano, was on his way to Rome, accompanying a bishop-elect friend. He had a parish that was weakening and had little virtue, and he wanted to obtain a virgin martyr from the catacombs to bring back to his church to restore that virtue and that faith. He visited the treasure house of relics where there were 13 bodies or, or bones, 13 of these saints. Only three had names. And the third one was Philomena. And when he was presented with her, a power came over him and he knew that this was a saint that he wanted at his church. So he petitioned for her and then he waited, hoping that he was going to get to bring Philomena home to his church. He waited and waited and eventually inquired. And he was told that first class relics that have names usually go to cathedrals, large parishes, not a simple dwindling church village that he was from, but he didn't give up. The bishop elect and one of the ambassadors, they all helped him and through the intercession of Philomena, he was eventually presented with her relics. On the way to Mugnano, the bishop elect and Francis are traveling with Philomena when all of a sudden the bishop feels a sharp jab on the back of his legs and he's like, what's going on? He makes the coachman get up and secure the luggage and the coachman's like, okay, well, the luggage is secure. So they go on and they try again. A second time, he feels a sharp jab in the back of his legs. And he's like, coachman, come on, what? You need to fix this. And the coachman's thinking, it, it is fixed. There's nothing wrong with the luggage. He checks it and they go on again. A third time, he's hit in the back of the legs. So he stops everything, he gets up, and he's trying to determine what is going on. And then the coachman pulls out from right under where they were sitting, the black ebony casket of Philomena's remains. And he remembers, he promised to give her a position of honor and virtue, and they had been sitting on top of her casket. I mean, how respectful is that? And so they pick up the casket, they put it in the seat across from them and then they venerate and they pray all the way back to their little village, a journey that only took one day instead of three. Keep in mind they still know nothing about this saint and immediately the miracles started happening. For example, the local woman who was determined that she would dress Philomena's remains. She was suffering from an incurable illness. She had it for over 12 years. The doctors of the day told her she would never be cured. And as she's dressing Philomena's remains, she's immediately cured. That same day, an attorney is brought into the church. He has sciatica, which is incurable, and he's cured. A noble lady with a cancer was scheduled for an amputation, and the day before, miraculously cured. The miracles go on and on for years. Blessed Anna Maria Taiji was a housewife and mother mystic. She had a daily prayer life to St. Philomena. Her granddaughter, Pepina, had been in an accident that had torn her pupil in such a way 
it was never going to be repaired. She took oil from the lamp that burns at Philomena's tomb and rubbed it on her eye and the next day she was miraculously cured. A really unique phenomenon that stands out for me is that when the bishop was scraping the dust from Philomena's bones to send out as a relic to be venerated by local parishes because words were spreading, he started sending it out more and more and he noticed that the bone wasn't being taken away from. It was as if he wasn't scraping anything. And so he lets the congregation of rites know that this is happening and they're like, you know what, we're, we're going to take over and we're going to do an experiment. So they start scraping Philomena's bones and the bones of an unknown saint that was found in the catacombs. And they start sending it both out all over. And at the end of the experiment, the unknown saint's bones had been depleted, but Saint Philomena still hadn't been touched. In fact, they commented it was almost as if there was more bone dust than there was before they started. But perhaps the most known or famous miracle is that of the blessed Pauline Jericho. She's daughter of an aristocratic family in France, and she was a close friend of John Vianney. She started the propagation of the faith, and so she has done a lot of work for the church. When she was 35 years old, she had a heart attack and was diagnosed with heart disease. And she was getting really, really sick, and nobody could cure that back then. And so she went to John Vianney, and she's like, what do I do? She's like, you have to go to Philomena. Now, she was over 600 miles away, and the doctors told her if she went, she wasn't going to make it, but she went anyway. Because of her great contributions to the church, Pope Gregory XVI agreed to meet with her on the way. So when she stopped in Rome, they met, but she was so ill, she couldn't go to him. So he came to her. Because he was convinced that she was going to die, he asked her, would you pray for me and pray for the church as soon as you get to heaven? And she agreed, but she had a request for him as well, that if she were to come back and walk for him, that he would immediately look into the inquiry of St. Philomena as a saint. He agreed to do this, again thinking that she wasn't going to make it, and even was commented, and it's recorded, that he said to a nun on his way out, I will never see her again. So Pauline continues on. She makes it to Nuniano, and it's a Saturday. And so she goes and visits the tomb of Philomena, and nothing happens. On Sunday, she goes to several masses and still nothing happens. So now it's Monday, August 10th, and the townspeople, in perhaps their own unique, charming way, because of their relationship with St. Philomena, are recorded to say things like, St. Philomena, your reputation is at stake. Can you hear us, St. Philomena? And so they're reaching out to her. But it wasn't until our Eucharistic Lord was held high in benediction that in that moment, Pauline was instantly cured. And so there are processions going throughout the little town, there are processions all the way to Rome, but the Pope still had not heard of the miracle. And so she gets there, Pauline gets there, and she asks if she can go into the Pope's chamber to surprise him, and they give her permission. So she walks in there, and he looks at her in astonishment and he says, quote, is it really you or an apparition? Is this really my daughter and has she come back from the grave or has God manifested in her favor the power of the virgin martyr? The Holy Father had her walk and then run and he had her stay in Rome for a year just so he could visit her every day and make sure that this indeed was a miracle. And on January 30th, 1837, he raised Philomena to the altars of the church based solely on the intercession of miracles that he became aware of. So this is a really good example that the heart in the body of Christ was satisfied. Yes, we have a head knowledge, but we also have a heart knowledge. We have a faith, we have a belief. And the heart of the vicar of Christ was satisfied purely on the miracles alone, even though we still didn't know who this was. We knew her name and that's all we knew. Soon after a mass in an office was approved in her honor and while this was taking place, 
three individuals in different parts of Italy who didn't know each other started receiving revelations as to who Saint Philomena was, a nun, a priest, and an artisan. The most well-known of these is the Mother Lucia L. Jesus and her revelations were immediately approved by the office at the time. Now each three of these individuals received the same information, different degrees of information, but it was all the same. But we are gonna look at Mother Lucia. And so from the official documentation of what was said, how this came about is that when Mother Lucia was praying to St. Philomena, she thought she heard a voice tell her the date of her death. And so she went to her mother superior and she's like, hey, this is what I heard. She also heard details about that trip from Rome to Mugnano in the first place when Philomena was first transferred and the, her casket is hitting them in the legs, as well as some other stories that weren't known to the public. And so the mother superior goes to Francesco and she's like, hey, this is what she's saying. And he confirmed every detail and he asked that she be open to more and so she went to Philomena and she asked more. So I'm going to read this in Philomena's own words because I can't do it justice to talk about it. My dear sister, I am the daughter of a prince who governed a small state in Greece. My mother was also of royal blood. My parents were without children. They were idolaters. They continually offered sacrifices and prayers to their false gods. A doctor from Rome lived in the palace in the service of my father. This doctor professed Christianity. Seeing the affliction of my parents by the impulse of the Holy Spirit, he spoke to them of Christianity and promised to pray for them if they consented to receive baptism. The grace which accompanied his words enlightened their understanding and triumphed over their will. They became Christians and obtained the long desired happiness that the doctor had assured them as the reward for their conversation and conversion. At the moment of my birth, they gave me the name of Lumina, in allusion to the light of faith, of which I had been, as it were, the fruit. The day of my baptism, they called me Philumina, or daughter of light. Because on that day I was born to the faith, the affection which my parents bore me was so great that they would have me always with them. It was on this account that they took me to Rome on a journey that my father was obliged to make. On the occasion of an unjust war, which he was threatened by, I was 13 years old. On our arrival in the capital of the world, we proceeded to the palace of the emperor and were admitted for an audience. As soon as the emperor Diocletian saw me, his eyes were fixed upon me. He appeared to be prepossessed in that manner during the entire time that my father was stating with animated feelings everything that could serve for his defense. As soon as father ceased to speak, the emperor desired him to be disturbed no longer, to banish all fear, to think only of living in happiness. These are the emperor's words. I shall place at your disposal all the force of the empire. I ask only one thing, that is the hand of your daughter. My father dazzled with an honor he was far from expecting, willingly acceded on the spot to the proposal of the emperor. When we returned to our dwelling, father and mother did all they could to induce me to yield to Diocletian's wishes and to theirs. I cried, do you wish that for the love of a man, I should break the promise I have made to Jesus Christ? My virginity belongs to him. I can no longer dispose of it. But you were young then, too young, answered my father, to form such an engagement. He joined the most terrible threats to the command that he gave me to accept the hand of Diocletian. The grace of my God rendered me invincible. 
my father not being able to make the emperor relent in order to disengage himself from the promise he had given was obliged by Diocletian to bring me to the imperial chamber. I had to witness for some time beforehand a new attack from my father's anger, my mother uniting her efforts to his endeavor to conquer my resolution. Caresses, threats, everything was employed to reduce me to compliance. At last I saw both of my parents fall at my knees and say to me with tears in their eyes, my child, have pity on thy father, thy mother, thy country, our country, our subjects. No, no, I answered them. My virginity, which I have vowed to God, comes before everything, before you, before my country. My kingdom is heaven. My words plunged them into despair, and they brought me before the emperor, who on his part did all in his power to win me. But his promises, his allurements, his threats were equally useless. He then got into a violent fit of anger and influenced by the devil, had me cast into one of the prisons of the palace where I was loaded with chains. Thinking that the pain and shame would weaken the courage with which my divine spouse inspired me, he came to see me every day. After several days, the emperor issued an order for my chains to be loosened that I may bake of a small portion of bread and water. He renewed his attacks, some of which, if not for the grace of God, would have been fatal to purity. The defeats which he always experienced were for me the prelude to new tortures. Prayer supported me. I ceased not to recommend myself to Jesus and his most pure mother. My captivity lasted 37 days, when in the midst of a heavenly light, I saw Mary holding her divine son in her arms. My daughter, she said to me, three days more of prison, and after 40 days, thou shalt leave this state of pain. Such happy news renewed my courage to prepare the frightful combat awaiting. The Queen of Heaven reminded me of the name I had been received and given in baptism. Thou art Lumina, as thy spouse is called Light or Sun. Fear not, I will aid thee. Now nature, whose weakness asserts itself, is humbling thee. In the moment of struggle, grace will come to thee and lend its force. The angel, who is mine also, Gabriel, whose name expresses force, will come to thy su successor. I will recommend thee especially to his care. The vision disappeared, leaving my prison scented with a fragrance like incense. I experienced a joy out of this world, something indefinable. What the Queen of Angels had prepared me for was soon experienced. Diocletian, despairing of bending me, decided on public chastisement to offend my virtue. He condemned me to be stripped and scourged like the spouse I had preferred to him. These were horrifying words. Silence, she is not ashamed to prefer to an emperor like me, a malefactor condemned to an infamous death by his own people. She deceives that my justice shall treat her as he was treated. She deserves this. The prison guards hasten, hesitated to unclothe me entirely, but they did tie me to a column in the presence of the great men of the court. They lashed me with violence until I was bathed in blood. My whole body felt like the open wound, but I did not faint. The tyrant had me dragged back to the dungeon, expecting me to die. I hoped to join my heavenly spouse. Two angels shining with light appeared to me in the darkness. They poured a soothing balm on my wounds, bestowing on me a vigor I had not had before the torture. When the emperor was informed of the change that had come over me, he had me brought before him. He viewed me with great desire and tried to persuade me that I owed my healing and regained vigor to Jupiter and another god that he had sent to me. He attempted to impress me with his belief that Jupiter desired me to be Empress of Rome. Joining to these seductive words promises of great honor, cooing the most flattering words. Diocletian tried to caress me. He attempted to complete the work of hell which he had begun. The divine spirit to whom I am indebted for constancy in preserving my purity seemed to fill me with light and knowledge. To all the proofs which I gave of the solidarity of our faith, neither Diocletian nor his own 
courtiers could find an answer. And then the frenzied emperor dashed at me, commanding a guard to chain an anchor around my neck and bury me deep in the waters of the Tiber. The order was executed. I was cast into the water, but God sent to me two angels who fastened the, unfastened the anchor. It fell into the river mud where it remains, no doubt, to this present time. The angels transported me gently in full view of the multitude of people upon the river bank. I came back unharmed, not even wet, after he plunged me with the heavy anchor. When a cry of joy rose from the watchers on the shore, and so many embraced Christianity by proclaiming their belief in God, Diocletian attributed my preservation to secret magic. Then the emperor had me dragged through the streets of Rome and shot at with showers of ankle, anger, excuse me, arrows. My blood flowed, but I did not faint. Diocletian thought I was dying and commanded the guards to carry me back to my dungeon. Heaven honored me with a new favor there. I fell into a sweet sleep. A second time, the tyrant attempted to have me pierced with sharper darts. Again, the archers bent their bows. They gathered all their strength, but the arrows refused to fly the second time. The emperor was present. In a rage, he called me a magician, and thinking that the action of fire could destroy the enchantment, he ordered that the darts be made red in a furnace and directed against my heart. He was obeyed. But these darts, after having gone over a part of the space which they were to cross to come to me, took a completely contrary direction and returned to strike those whom they had been hurled. Six of the archers were killed by them. Several among them renounced paganism. The people began to render public testimony to the power of God that protected me. These murmurs and acclamations infuriated the tyrant. He determined to hasten my death by piercing my neck with a lance. My soul took flight toward my heavenly spouse who placed me with the crown of virginity and the palm of martyrdom in a distinguished place along the elect. The day that was so happy for me and saw me enter into glory was Friday, the third hour after midday, the same hour that saw my divine master expire. And so as we talked about at the beginning, many people, popes, saints, lay people at the time, had devotions to Philomena. Now keep in mind there is a difference between being devoted to someone, perhaps like in a marriage where you're devoted to your spouse, and Catholic devotions. So a Catholic devotion, it, it implies prayers or supplications, especially internal or private prayer. And there are a few different devotions that you may want to consider if you feel called to pray to St. Philomena as your saint. There is the Chaplet of St. Philomena. It contains 13 small red beads, three large white beads, and then the crucifix. Often her medal is on it as well. There's the Novena, or a nine-day prayer to St. Philomena. There are actually several of them, and you can find them online. Find one that feels called, that you feel called to do, that you feel in your heart. There's the pilgrimage, or a journey, to a place undertaken that you can go to to venerate her. So there's obviously Mugnano in Italy. I don't know about you, I won't be going to Italy anytime soon. That's a place you can go. There's a place in France and in the United States, there's actually a shrine in Briggsville, Wisconsin, which is near the Dells. So you don't have to go that far to do your pilgrimage. There's the use of the oil that we heard about for some miracles. You can get this oil from her tomb in Italy you can get it from France, there's a place in the United States, and you can get it from Briggsville. There are some prayers that go along with the oil, but some of these miracles were done with just the oil alone and the intent of heart. There's also the cord of St. Philomena, which is a white and red cord. Often it was worn around the waist. St. John Vianney helped 
to popularize this and get this out there. He wore the cord. There's also a wrist version. And this cord is usually made of, of wool, so that perhaps it's a little itchy. It's not the, the nicest thing to wear, but with it comes indulgences. And so that might be something that you feel called to take upon in your spiritual life. And just to review for those of you who maybe don't know or have forgotten, like I did at your age, even though we confess and our sins are forgiven, this, that won't send a person to hell, but we still have to make up for our sins. We have to do penance. We have to become more perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And indulgences are ways that we can do that. Now, usually there's more specific things. It's not like you can just put the cord on and boom, you have an indulgence. There's certain indulgences that come with the cord. When you have time, I encourage you to look it up. There are a few different ones and maybe you're called to do that. The main things that you can pray to Philomena for, and keep in mind, you can pray to her for anything, any cause, but the main things that she has responded to collectively that we're aware of are finances or concerns about what's going on with financial matters, concerns about family, concerns of the heart, and most of all, concerns about purity or those who are struggling with purity that is something, as we can see from her own words, that she feels very empowered to through her heart. And so we are also going to end in prayer. And I'm going to invite you to close your eyes so that we may have a moment to offer an intention to Philomena. If any of you have that, then when I pause, just offer this in the silence of your heart. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. O faithful virgin and glorious martyr, Saint Philomena, who works so many miracles on behalf of the poor and sorrowing, have pity on me. Thou knows the multitude and diversity of my needs. Behold me at thy feet, full of misery, but full of hope. I entreat thy charity, O great saint. Graciously hear me and obtain from God a favor favorable answer to the request which I now humbly lay before thee. I am firmly convinced that through thy merits, through thy scorn, thy suffering, and the death thou didst endure, united to the merits of the passion and death of Jesus, thy spouse, I shall obtain what I ask of thee, and in the joy of my heart, I will bless God, who is admirable in his saints. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, she's good. Philomena? She is good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have my moments when, just, when heaven allows. I just lost my job. That's all God. <laughs> Um, a couple of things that Shannon mentioned. One, I have some of the oil right here that I actually ordered from the Shrine of Mignano. If anybody, when they come up, if they, when they're done, if you want to come up and just anoint yourself with the oil, I'm happy to let you do that. Just take it and just maybe put a sign across at your forehead or something like that. That'd be fine. But she said there's many, many, many miracles attributed to this oil. And I've actually noticed that at home, yeah, this oil has some power too. I mean, like when somebody's really agitated, I've done it for myself, I'm really agitated about something, and I'll just anoint myself with the oil, and there's like an instant calm that comes over me. And so it's, there's definitely something to that. Um, I also have here, and of course, you know, some of you, not all of you, went to the shrine on our um, pilgrimage retreat last year and met Susan there. Um, Susan's a friend of mine, and she gave me this second class relic of St. Philomena there's the burial cloths that she's wrapped in and they have to change them from time to time. And um, this is just a little tiny piece of that. So this is, you know, touch the body of St. Philomena. I don't know that you can, uh, like if you have a first class relic, you can make something a third class relic out of it. I don't think you can do that with a second, but I'm not sure either. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, just, I would, there's so much more to Philomena. I mean, you literally could have, she could have talked for another hour easily about St. Philomena. There's many, many cool things about her body itself in the shrine in, in Italy. 
Um, there's really cool things, and Susan told you some of those things about the shrine up in Briggsville. Um, it's, it's really, really interesting to learn about her. She's a really powerful saint, and I would highly recommend you, you learn more about her. At some of the DTS nights, there's so much to tell about some of these saints, it's hard to distill it down into something that's that can fit into the entire time. And so sometimes we have to not make the presentation on the reflection of the rosary. And this was one of those weeks. And so the fourth of the joyful mysteries is the presentation of the Lord. And the grace of that mystery is purity of mind, body, heart, and will. And I think if you think about it, I think you need to start with the purity of will because your will needs to to align with what God wants for you in order for any of the other things to be pure. So if if I'm saying, okay, I want my will and no matter what, I want what's good for me, then the other things can't can't become pure. And so when I start to align my will with God and start wanting what he wants, then I start becoming more holy. And so then my mind and my heart and my body can become pure. The saint that we talked about was Saint Philomena. And St. Philomena, she uh, had her will so well aligned with God that at the age of 13, she was able to give her life uh, rather than have her purity stained. And so she, she withstood, you know, uh, the advances of a, of a Roman emperor and her parents trying to convince her that she needed to do this. She as a 13-year-old stood strong in that. What example can we take from that, right? Teenagers have a great potential for holiness. And so we can, we can look at St. Philomena and we can say, this is possible. Holiness is possible even for a 13-year-old because she had aligned her will with God's will and she was so in love with Jesus. She was willing to say, Jesus, what you want, I want. And she wanted to be the spouse of Christ. And so she was willing to defend her virginity against everything else. It was that important to her. Can you imagine what it would be like in today's world if more people had the example of St. Philomena known to them? I know that when I was a teenager, had I known about saints like this, I think there was a few decisions I would have made differently. I can't say that I would have been like this totally pure guy, right? But I do know that I never heard about any of these saints. And so I didn't have those examples. And so all I had is what the culture taught me. And so that's what I went with, right? That's what my friends went with. And and so we just didn't have these great examples. And so that's why it's just so incredibly important that we, we take the lessons from the lives of the saints and so that we can become more like the St. Philomenas of the world. And these are the saints that we need, that not just the teenage saints, but the ones that have purity of heart, mind, body, and will.